Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the show. I came across this really interesting article on Smithsonian regarding this computer scientist who is able to read unopened scrolls damaged by the volcanic ash of Mount Vesuvius in AD 79 that destroyed a countless, countless material and written original works by Epicurus, Epicurus and just to name a few, Epicurus and some of his students. There, there was this other scroll that was not part of the um, library in Italy that got taken over by ash from the uh, volcanic site. It was a different uh, scroll from Israel that this uh, computer scientist was also a- able to read. And this is huge because, first of all, there's a... Aside from the Library of Alexandria, there's really no other known location that still survives that has these original works. Because a lot of the works that we have now that come from, that derive from the antiquity, they've been transcribed by third parties over time and filtered through language and all that stuff. These works are original works straight from the Romans. So a huge advance in our understanding of the learned thought of the time and their traditions of the time. I mean, we know a lot about them now, but not nearly as much as we will know from deciphering all of these scrolls. Now, I want to get into... It's a pretty long article, so I want to condense it down as uh, as best as I can. In order to understand really what's going on, I have to give you some background on the guy. So this uh, scientist, he uses subatomic physics to decipher 2,000-year-old texts. Um, this is what it looks like. So this is a charred papyrus scroll from the Herculaneum. Herculaneum? I think that's how you say it. And that is basically the library I was talking about found in this villa that allegedly belonged to the father-in-law of Julius Caesar himself. It's a really interesting article, and some parts of it are just, man, you just shake your head because of all the lost scrolls that haven't survived up until now um, is, is startling. But he has this, this x-ray facility that's huge. It's called the Diamond Light Source, and he uses this to, in a nutshell, read these unopened scrolls. So this beam focuses on a tiny crumb of papyrus that has already survived one of the most destructive forces on the planet, 2,000 years of history. comes from a scroll found in Herculaneum, an ancient Roman resort on the Bay of Naples, Italy, that was buried by the eruption of Mount Vesuvius in AD 79. So they first started uh, excavating or finding these scrolls in the 1700s. So Charles III of Spain... Um, He was in charge of a lot of uh, southern Italy at the time. And he sent these workmen who discovered the remains of this villa, the Herculaneum that I was talking about. And they found 2,000 papyrus scrolls. And these things look like charred hot dogs or cigars or something. And to them, they're like, oh, it's coal. And they would just light it on fire or just like chuck them into the sea. They didn't know what they were dealing with. So um, (laughs) a lot of them just were destroyed that way. And then over time, a bunch of scholars tried to unfurl them and just destroyed them in the process. And then, uh, I forget who it was, but someone from France, they invented this machine that would slowly unfurl them and it would just break into these pieces of... of, uh, I don't know, crumbs of papyrus. And that also destroyed a bunch of them. Although they were able to pull out bits and pieces of writing, for the most part, it was just not going to work out that way. And for a long time, these there are guys in Britain now, I think like the people in France and Britain and also in Israel and Italy, they have these, they're just sitting on all these um, scrolls, these ancient, ancient scrolls from 2000 plus, almost 2000 years ago. Again, these scrolls represent the only intact library known from the classical world, straight from the hands of Greek and Roman scholars themselves. So there's hundreds of papyri now that are left unopened. Uh, no, they're very protected, 
protective of them, the, the keepers of these. For a guy like Seals, which is Brent Seals, this is a um, computer scientist who's behind all uh, the unfurling the, these, these ancient texts without actually physically unrolling, unrolling them. He is the only guy in centuries to have the know-how and wherewithal to do it. But he's still, he, to this day, he's still in the process of almost he has to prove himself to these people to let him read and scan some of these, uh, these ancient scrolls. That, that's basically what this whole article is about, like all his background, what he's done to this day, and what he's still waiting on. He has this x-ray detector called Hexatech, which is basically the most cutting edge of this type of uh, x-ray technology that finds faint signals of, of what's the actual paper and what was the ink. Because the ink is all faded now, so the only thing left are like whatever was in the ink. So either charcoal or lead, something. So that's what this x-ray technology is meant to do. He's trying to create from a 2D scanning, a three-dimensional image of what's inside the scroll. And he says himself, I don't think there's another detector in the world right now that could do this kind of measurement. And he's right. And this is an example of what uh, the ancient Torah scroll that I was talking about earlier um, from Ayin Gedi, which is a Byzantine era synagogue. And the person who held on to this, I forget who it was, it says his name in the article, but it's not really important. He entrusted this to, uh, he's one of the first guys that trusted Seal. And he's like, hey, you say you can do this? Fine. Just tell me what this is and I'll put in a good word or something. for, or Like it increases his reputation. So he he found out that it, cre it included the verses from the beginning of Leviticus. And he was able to read what was in here with his technology. Let's talk a little bit about the Seals guy really quick. Um, he's from California. He was he became fascinated with this idea of computer vision, which is converting two-dimensional photographs into 3D models. And this is the type of technology that allows the Mars rover to, to navigate the terrain on its own. He became involved with the British Library Project, which is, I talked about this in a previous episode. It's basically a project that seeks to create the digital renaissance by digitizing all kinds of ancient manuscripts. So he became involved in that. From here, he f he created a digital version of the only surviving copy of old the old English epic Beowulf, and he to do that he used ultraviolet light to enhance the text. So, um, but what he's trying to do with the stuff like the Dead Sea Scrolls and um, the stuff from the Herculaneum, it's it requires even more complex technology and more complex techniques other than just enhancing the surviving text because beowulf is not beowulf is old first of all that's like 980 or something like that but the stuff from from the herculaneum is way almost a thousand years older than that and the ideas that are conveyed in those scrolls are probably even older if he does succeed in translating or tr uh, digitizing all of those scrolls, make no mistake, that will rewrite the canon of what we know about uh, classical antiquity and beyond. Um, and a, lo a lot of people get triggered by that for whatever reason. I don't know why. It doesn't take away from what we know now. It adds to what we know now. So Seals, he, he develops an algorithm to create an artificial flat version of these scrolls, and that was the first step toward him feeling out this tech. Cause remember he's on the cutting edge. He's the only guy to have the interest and energy and focus to do this. There's no one before him. So he's on his own. Basically he's, he's the pioneer of, of pioneers in this field. He has no uh, frame of reference other than, trial and error what he can do and what he can't do what's feasible and what's not feasible again i can't stress how incredible his work is guys this is it doesn't seem like much but it's a big deal there's no otherwise those scrolls are as good as dust eventually because eventually they're gonna be so deteriorated that we that not even this is gonna help it 
Um, so he used digital. So after that, after he he created this two dimensional, or he found out that he could create an artificial flat version of a rolled up scroll. He used digital imaging to virtually unwrap the unopened schools, not just to flatten the crinkled pages, but to actually unopen it. He experimented with medical grade computed tomography, like CT scanning, if you guys have ever gotten a concussion or something like that, or any brain trauma, or, other, or broken bones or anything like that. He used that sort of technology to create a 3D image of the internal structure of an object. The litmus, te litmus test for this was he scanned an authentic object, a uh, 15th century book binding, thought to contain a fragment of the Ecclesiastes written hidden inside and it worked so now that he knew it worked he decided to build upon that so that's what this article also covered the bulk of it we're not going to go over everything he got the idea to ask around for whoever the curators museums uh, even churches and synagogues whoever would have these manuscripts these ancient manuscripts even the dead sea scrolls he wanted to uh try it on out on and then in 2005 at the national library in naples he got the the inspiration to be like okay we're gonna do this that that's basically in 2005 is where it all started that was 13 14 16 years ago now almost 16 years ago so this giant library in the herculaneum the ones that they were able to open and whatever it was that they were able to transcribe over the past 200 years, uh, they contain Greek philosophical texts, such as what I mentioned earlier, Epicurus, the Athenian philosopher. Others were historical accounts of Rome by Quintus Aeneas, and it tells the final hours of Antony and Cleopatra. And these are just fragments, which make up big stories in what we know of uh, the Roman times. So, so um, yeah, th those are just fragments. Imagine an exponential increase in our knowledge of those times. There's a lot we can learn from this, guys, and apply it not just to know as like useless knowledge, but it has a pur it could have a purpose today if implemented correctly in our life. And I'm that, that's something huge for me to say when I don't even know what's written in those things. But I'm only going by what little we have extracted from those has had. A, already a profound uh, effect on our view of ancient Rome and, and classical antiquity. So none of the Herculaneum scrolls has been open since the 1800s. Um, they focused easing information out of the already revealed text. They're too, they're too scared, and rightfully so, to try to open them any further. They don't want to get them destroyed. So in the 1990s, these BYU researchers did something very similar, but, but not as complex. They they photographed the surviving uh, open papyri using multispectral imaging, and they were able to read more. But and it was a huge breakthrough. But it's not what uh, Seals is trying to do, because uh, what they really like to do is to read a text from beginning to end, and they can't do that because they just have fragments, right? So imagine like peeling something open, and then parts of it just get just tear off or like just literally br brittle. They're so brittle that they just turn to dust or little crumbs and completely destroying it, unsalvageable. So that's basically what they did. They threw the dice and then whatever they could transcribe digitally, they did, but it was all in fragments. Seals at this point is very, very confident that he could get this done, but he did not, he underestimated the difficulty of getting permission to study the scroll. So this is why the holdup is so much. It's not that he doesn't have the, the know-how or wherewithal to do it. It's that it is possible, but he just can't get gain their trust to to get them to get all of them. Although he has uh, won the trust of a few people, so Seals eventually received permission to study three small fragments from the Institute of France. They also have some of those scrolls, the Herculaneum scrolls, in their possession. So one problem he he hoped to solve was to detect ink hidden in inside rolled up scrolls. The Herculaneum scrolls were written with ink made primarily of char charcoal mixed with water, which is very difficult to distinguish from the carbonized papyrus it sits on, because these are almost 2,000-year-old parchments, right? So after a while, it just blends together, and there's no real marker of the writings anymore. It's just hard to distinguish under that, that scope. So what he did was he looked for trace elements in the ink, anything that might show up in the, in the CT scan and he discovered lead which 
definitely helps. And still he failed because um, despite the traces of lead, it still appeared invisible to him. So he had to go back to the drawing board. So what he did was uh, he developed software to locate and model the surface layer within a wound-up scroll, which analyzed each point in as many as 12,000 cross-sections. Then he looks for density changes that correspond to the ink and applies filters or other techniques to increase the contrast of the letters as much as possible. The final step is to figuratively unroll the image for reading. So he devel he finally developed that. And after that, he spent time in Paris to to amp up his algorithms and 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 sharpen his ideas to the point where he had a new chance to approach this guy from is the is israel antiquities authority the guy who had the that that scroll i showed you earlier that looked like a cigar and from there he was able to uh he was successful and that caught the eye of uh, other people like his CT scans got the eye of other people. And then a few years later, he was given scans by this guy named Mochella, who was doing the same thing. Uh, similar, they were sh sharing notes. And then he hit this home run with the En Gedi scroll, the guy from the Israel Antiquities Authority. And let's talk about this, uh, how successful this uh, En Gedi scroll was. So in July 2015, he announced his re results. Um, the Hebrew scribes had mixed metals into their ink, unlike the scrolls from, uh, the, from Italy. And then his software correctly mapped the letters to the rolled up parchment, then virtually unfurled it, revealing all the surviving text in perfect sequence on each of the five wraps of the scroll. There were 35 lines of text in two columns composed of Hebrew letters just two millimeters tall. That's how accurate this is to the T, to just how big these, uh, the spacing and the, how big the letters were. And then the Israeli researchers took a look at it and they're like, oh yeah, this is the first two chapters of the book of Leviticus, no doubt about it. And it, it dates exactly to the third or fourth century AD. So it's a little bit younger than the Herculaneum scrolls, which is a huge, huge uh, feather in his cap. He's basically creating his own portfolio of a subject that didn't exist before him. That's how cutting edge this guy is. This was a hugely significant find for biblical scholars. It is now the oldest extant copy of the Hebrew Bible outside the Dead Sea Scrolls. And then from there, after he, after this was all publicized, uh, he went to Oxford now because he still couldn't get the, the access from France to the scrolls, even after this. So um, he goes to Oxford University who has four Herculaneum scrolls. And from there, you can, now you guys can see he's kind of shopping his skills to all these different people. So to prove the value of his approach, Seals asked the Bodleian to ask uh, to let him analyze uh, P Herc 118. So that's just one of the uh, parchments that they have. So to July 2017, the 12 frames were removed from storage and taken to Howell's third floor office. Something of a coup for Seals. So this is what they look like in three dimensions. This is what the scroll looked like. It's pretty interesting stuff. It looks like CGI, right? Well, it kind of is CGI, except it's this is an actual rendering of the actual object. So they were able to zoom in on these images and read what was written on them. And he presented them in last year, I think, to Oxford, actually. So uh, they found some new details in the scans. So they, they made out the name Pythocles, who was a young follower of Epicurus. They deciphered the column structure of the text, 17 characters per line, which is crucial for the rest of the scroll because they know now there's, it's got to follow that type of st structure to some degree. And especially when they're jo joining the different fragments together, because remember, they, ha they still have some stuff in their possession that is separated in fragments only. So this is this is the, the facility that he works at. This is a diamond light source and this, it reminds me of like the Large Hadron Collider. I mean, this thing is so com I don't even know what just by looking at this, I feel like I'm spending billions of dollars. Um, but that's him that seals this, this dude who is on a mission and is very confident in his ability. And you'd need a guy like him to to do something like this. So what he wanted to do now, he wanted to have another crack at reading these the ink on this this parchment from uh, the Herculaneum, and 
as I said earlier, there are traces of lead in it. So what he wanted to do was he wanted to fire these powerful x-rays through the lead and then from there the lead emits an electromagnetic radiation or some like some sort of light, some fluoresces, a type of, uh, it has some sort of frequency that's specific that he's looking for. And he feels like if he did that and he captured the protons at, of this uh, emitted uh, electromagnetic radiation, then he felt like if he could read what is on there then he he basically has to refine that technique and then he'll be able to uh read everything the problem was that there's a minuscule fluorescence of the actual letter remember the letter is like a few millimeters tall right and he feels like the danger would be the radiation from the protective lead lining the room might interfere with him being able to see the fluorescence of the of the uh letter he says that it'd be a big uh it'd be hard so what they eventually, long story short, they f they found what they're looking for, a grainy but clearly recognizable C, which is the lowercase c is a sigma, something sigma. So with this, he's proven that he displayed a legible image using his technology to the Oxford audience. So he hopes that this would give him street cred, so to speak, to get the the other guys from France and Italy who rejected him to give up their scroll, uh, s scrolls and let him read them or let him scan them. Now, the kicker to this, though, they think that when the, when the Spanish workmen f uh, f in the 1800s, 1700s, 1800s, 1700s, when they found the villa and they found this library, they didn't find everything. Apparently, they're going to do more archaeologists are going to do more excavations of of this villa and they're pretty sure that there's even more scrolls countless scrolls because this is a first of all it's a villa and there was a library and if it really did belong to julius caesar's father-in-law then there's pro it's probably home to all kinds of different texts so if they do find this these texts Th this abundance of text and they hand it over to either seals or someone close to seals who knows how to uh, do this process then like I said earlier the, there's going to be a different picture of antiquity here so that's pre that pretty much sums up this article guys um, I'll have the link I strongly suggest if you have like a if you have like 15 minutes or so just to read it and look through it and maybe highlight some stuff that that you want to look further into and just get your mind mind blown because a, a lot of complaints are that oh we've learned everything there is to learn uh the people that that came before us they wrote all that stuff down we can't even read it so there's no point it's hopeless all that is bunk now Th this unlocks a whole new chapter and probably years and years of research are going to have to go into once all the i'm talking about once all this is digitized and ready for translation it's going to take a long time to actually get through everything so this opens up a whole new avenue that i think is worthy of of study in all kinds of universities um it's going to change classical antiquity as we know it, it won't be the stagnating uh weird uh academia uh the state of academia now where people just go by faith this is going to be uh huge for for the classics so let me know what you guys think and i'll see you guys later